Too often, the media focuses exclusively on the violent and tumultuous crises occurring daily around the world, and with clickbait exploiting negative social events for the sake of increased ratings and revenue, there are few incentives for media outlets to focus on the good that is happening in the world every day. Even media channels dedicated to peace building and sustainable development remain focused on the ills of corruption, war, and conflict rather than the efforts of peace builders within those conflicts. But peace talks too. And with this show, the voice of peace will be amplified. Mr. Rogers is often quoted in saying that when crisis strikes, look for the helpers. This show intends to do just that. Every day, right here in Vermont and around the U.S., there are thousands of engaged citizens actively building peace. We plan to amplify their efforts and we seek to develop a platform where peace builders all over can connect with each other across social boundaries and industry sectors to collaborate for the benefit of our collective community. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Peace Talks, and today we are meeting with Jason Van Nest. He is an architect, a professor at New York Tech, and the founder and CEO of Build With Logic. Glad to have you on the show, Jason. It's a pleasure to join you and your audience. Thank yeah, you. No, I, uh, I'm really delighted to be talking with you because I think your perspective on on all of these, uh, you know, issues of peace building and development and, and how we engage with our communities is just, you know, squarely in line with a lot of uh, what I think you believe in. And so um, I'm just excited to have you here. Uh, how about we kick it off with, uh, tell us about yourself. Tell us what you're doing right now. Sure. Uh, so I'm a licensed architect, state of New York. Yeah. Uh, moved to Vermont um, almost a decade ago now. Mm. Uh, and I teach architecture, mostly uh, architectural technologies, mm. um, New York Institute of Technology, but remotely. Um, and while I've had some extra time with my research, um, after practicing for a few years uh, um, in the private sector, building homes in Vermont and really getting a comprehensive look at the housing crisis we face in our communities, mm -hmm. uh, I have struck out to uh, found mm. a modular uh, uh, building company uh, based in southern Vermont. Um, we're focusing on bringing all of the sort of manufacturing wisdom yeah. that we've developed uh, in the, say, automotive or airline uh, uh, aerospace sector. We're bringing that in to um, cure some of the, the issues that we see um, in construction, the inefficiencies, yeah. the yeah. So let's let's let on for a second, and maybe just if you could tell us, like you know, what Build with Logic is or Logic Building Systems, just um, a little more directly, you know, is what what is the the primary function of the company? Well, so we we've noticed that um, there's a lot of problem getting tradesmen onto job sites for housing, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we're coming to market with um, modular solutions for kitchens, bathrooms, and utility rooms. Okay. All the sort of complicated tech core of a home. Yeah. And um, our solution, you can just wheel right into a job site, you know, just a, a man with a pallet jack. Okay. Uh, bring it onto first, second floor, third floor. We're aiming, um, because we see an urgent need, we're aiming at, at multifamily housing hmm. really, and helping, helping folks either in low-income housing situations or in missing middle housing situations, yeah. essentially springboard their kitchens, bathrooms, and you know, um, utility rooms so that they're starting almost the 50-yard line when it comes wow. to fitting out the building. Okay, so like you, you, you basically bring completely finished kitchens or bathrooms or utility rooms right to the job site, and all they have to do is connect the, the pieces. Absolutely, they're plug and play, yeah. and um, the... The technical uh, tradesmen uh, at the job site have to solve the problem of getting all that plug-and-play branch wiring and branch plumbing that's already in place stemmed down to the utility core of the building. And that's it. That's it. How how much how how, how much faster can you build a house with this kind of a process? So our, our focus is on multifamily housing. Okay. Um, so you know we estimate that we could make a 16 to 20 month single family housing construction cycle get down to 12 months but our focus is on the 12 to 14 month cycle of multifamily housing so this is like condos yeah, yeah. and uh, you know the such and what when we're trying to get townhouses condos and apartments yeah, that to to uh, 
uh, market, usually those are in like a 12 to 14 month uh -huh. time frame, and we can get that down to eight to nine months. Wow. So saving so three to four months of yeah, on site. You're taking off a considerable amount of time in the construction process. Absolutely. Well, okay, so you can you can build these things a lot faster. Um, can can you speak a little bit to how this will you know directly benefit Vermonters, uh, you know, from from changing to on-site construction to more of a manufactured housing module? Like, what what is what is the real benefit here? For sure. So, I just want to be careful about some some language. Manufactured housing is a, a full house coming down the road, you okay. know, what we yeah. traditionally call a double wide or single wide. Yeah. Uh, we're not participating in that marketplace, but in the modular marketplace where okay. you know, city governments would um, uh, use municip municipal code to sure. dictate, you know, hey, we need to inspect your kitchen and bathroom, and they can on site. Your larger question, though, was you know, how, what kind of influence, I think, are we trying to, to bring to this, yeah. um, not just marketplace, but community? Right. Um, and <clears throat> by reducing the amount of time it takes to build multifamily housing mm -hmm. and coming to market with a solution that doesn't require a bunch of tradesmen to coordinate, we can both come in and cost less mm. to build the same collection of kitchens, bathrooms, and take less time, which means that there are fewer resources that communities need to dedicate to realize the same amount of housing. Wow. So we're pretty excited about essentially creating more stakeholders and more community access to low and, yeah. and um, missing middle housing. Yeah. Um, if I may add, sure. um, we actually consider ourselves a bit of a workforce development. Uh, Interesting. Group. Yeah, that's that's not something you normally hear in like housing market conversations. Workforce development, but uh, you have talked with me about it a little bit, and I think you're winning me over. <laughs> you know uh, that uh, this is really more about workforce development than it is about housing. Can can you kind of spell that out uh, yeah. for the audience as well? Well, at at a at a sort of grand level, uh -huh. um, we're trying to push more of the sort of work that has to go on at a construction job site into a factory. Mm -hmm. So at, at a big level, that is developing more manufacturing mm -hmm. in the sort of community cores of Vermont, mm -hmm. like what we're trying to do in southern Vermont, and push more wisdom, technical ability, and paychecks towards the higher you know, manufacturing jobs that yeah. uh, we'd all like to see in our communities. Right. Um, at, at a sort of more granular level, um, I think anyone who's tried to sort of get a toilet unplugged or unclogged mm. or some extra wiring, maybe a new uh, yeah. light installed in the last 10 years, you know, a lot of the tradesmen's trucks running around our cities right now have, you know, addresses for different states. Massachusetts folks um, are in high demand in southern Vermont, New Hampshire and, and New York folks in northern Vermont. So what we've unfortunately seen for a long time in, in our Vermont communities is a bit of a brain drain mm. where we raise really outstanding um, children that realize that there are a lot more greener fields to raise money and, and have a career than Vermont. Yeah, and as a result, intended, huh? I, I'm really sorry to see it because <laughs> my, my own five-year-old's gonna be facing these issues shortly. Right. So we're, we're really trying to address the workforce development problem. We just don't have enough tradesmen mm -hmm. that are running around Vermont. And so by opening a, a manufacturing facility where tradesmen can train, mm. hey, let's install a, a toilet five times this morning in five different modules, those tradesmen that don't feel like manufacturing is right for them hopefully will have a vibrant career. Yeah. Um, where I live in Brattleboro, yeah. there are, um, the average housing stock was studied, it was 74 years old in, in 2021. So yeah. the average housing stock in Brattleboro today is closer to 77 years old. Wow. That's a lot of toilets that somebody's going to have to renovate, unclog, and whatnot. And we'd love to be the training facility, the ideal cooperative for the trade schools in our area wow. to wow. help students get that experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely see the value in that for communities. I think that, you know, bringing, val bringing trades back to Vermont and uh, showing the respect to those types of professions that I think they deserve is is uh, really it's it's important work and you know on the other side you're also talking about resolving some of this housing some of these housing issues that we're having with uh, you know reduced cost to housing um, allowing more people to participate in what has often been considered the American dream you know of having having your own home 
and and being able to to be involved in community in that way. So you know, I I love all of this, and I, I think I want to dig into some of these points a little bit further. But before we get into that, I, I want to understand where you where you started with this. You know, what what got you started on this journey, and and how did you end up in the place that you're at now? You know. Sure. Um, <clears throat> in a nutshell, I tried to be an architect and I failed. Mm. The first time I tried to become an architect, um, I got a Bachelor of Science from Georgia Tech. Okay. I was a Hoop Scholar student. And um, I came to New York City and uh, didn't have enough educational background to qualify and sit for the exams. Huh. So after 18 months of trying to do the New York City lifestyle, mm. I just actually burned out, mm. uh, sold all my belongings, hiked the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> at least just from Atlanta back to New York. Um, and I learned uh, out there in the wilderness really all the things internally that were holding me back. And then the simple act of like setting up your tent every night and oh, is it going to rain? You know, should I put it up in this bluff of trees? Yeah. You know, I became the world's best site planning professor <laughs> accidentally, <laughs> right? Waking up in your like wet, wet tent, tent is yeah, like, you, okay. You start to figure out where <laughs> the best sites are. That's, right. that, yeah. I love that. So I, when I came back uh, uh, to New York um, and then eventually went through grad school, um, I was certain architecture was my path and I was blessed to land um, in a, a class in grad school that taught programming. Mm. I didn't even qualify for the class. I was too young, so I volunteered to be the TA. Oh. Just because I was so urgently needing to learn how to make the tools that designers use to design housing. You know, what do they need at what point? Yeah, kind of designing the design process. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And and you know, I rode a wave, you know, luckily and professionally, where um architects had transitioned from drawing with CAD, mm. which is kind of um, I think everyone understands roughly drawing all their drawings by hand in the computer to making a model. Like a then, 3D model. Exactly, yeah. a digital 3D yeah. model. Okay. And then having that thing draw your drawings for you. So for, for 10 years, I was running with my little brief, briefcase um, on the tenure track at New York Tech, but also flipping architecture firms from one workflow, which is you're responsible for every line, mm -hmm. to another workflow, which is let me show you how to make a model, think 3D. Um, how you lay up the walls, how you lay up the modules, how you lay up everything okay. is a preview of how this thing will be constructed. And let's think holistically yeah. together. So you, you were really a part of that transformation of kind of trying to lead the industry into more of a 3D digital design space mm -hmm. rather than, uh, rather than you know, using uh, technology that is you know, from the, the 60s, 70s. And, 60s and 70s, <laughs> right? Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how was that experience for you? Like, what, what did you get out of that? So, uh, I mean, from a, a professional point of view, what I realized quickly was that we, as architects, are making a product model. Yeah. And um, professionally, the folks that kept hiring me back for my consulting experience were in the modular industry. Mm. Oh, if Jace helps us build one, you know, digital model, we can make 80. Yeah. Right? Um, which is like a huge return on their investment. But from a sort of uh, social point of view, mm -hmm. um, I uh, was lucky enough to have the privilege of sort of saying the same thing over and over again and realizing that we're moving from a representational technology where yeah. you have an idea and you draw the idea and that thing is the medium where you communicate it. Sure, yeah, you, you get to kind of share it with people right? on paper. Right, and, and how good a drawer you are Right. It's like how well you can communicate your idea. Exactly. Yeah. And and what we're, what we were transitioning still in the in the field of architecture is from representation to simulation. Interesting. So here's a 3D model. I can even time how it sort of appears. Mm -hmm. And that'll be a, a simulacrum or a, a simulation of how it's constructed. Interesting. And if we move this, we can get immediate feedback. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we can figure out, oh, the volume of the building changed, the heat loads changed, oh, right. we can move some windows, and now the cooling requirements have changed in this room. That's fascinating. So you can really figure out all of those, like, core, like, issues that, you know, contractors and construction folks are, are trying to deal with on the ground in real time, like, in a virtual space. And nine months before they t tackle it. Yeah, yeah. So that they're not having to try and solve these problems 
on site right. once the plans have already been laid and they're supposed to follow the roadmap. And the materials are ordered. Yeah. And you can't change this truss because it's coming down Route 9, you know, tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you, you know, we, we moved into, I mean, architects' drawings are always called plans. But mm -hmm. the practitioners that really understood the power of this realized that we became fortune tellers. Right? Not just people who plan, but people who know, oh, there's a clash here, and if we don't solve it in time, yeah. you guys are going to have a terrible problem in a few months. Yeah, no, I, I actually um, am getting into GIS and like geospatial architecture design in general, just more for development you know, of, of larger community spaces. Uh, and uh, I, I see a lot of parallels in, in the same kinds of um, opportunities that I'm trying to identify and explore, right? You know, because you know, it's really difficult to um, do effective planning uh, in development spaces in general uh, without some kind of visual representation that can help you to suss out those more critical questions. This is excellent. Yeah, if you can't see a problem, yeah. then you can't solve that problem. Right. Right. And so, you know, I remember in, in Fast Food Nation, the author writes about how um, the McDonald's Corporation would buy flyover imagery from, you know, planes mm -hmm. in the 70s. In the 70s. They were trying to do GIS. Yeah. Right. And they were like planning, OK, well, in 20 years, this is going to clearly be the area of growth. Let's start buying real estate now. Mm -hmm. And we all now have that power with yeah. simple G GIS. Yeah, um, and just for the audience sake, GIS is Global Imaging System. Uh, if you look at a Google map, you're using GIS. That's the free tool that we're all very familiar with. GPS is based on GIS technologies, um, and the advancements in that field is, is allowing us to do a lot of what Jason is talking about uh, in a much more granular way which I think is fascinating. Yeah. Um, it really helps us to save resources and resolve issues way before we start construction. And become astronauts, right? Like the, <laughs> the common theme of astronauts that go to space, see the pale blue dot and come back, mm -hmm. is that, oh, we're all in this together. And with that mm -hmm. kind of holistic view that we get in these platforms, we really don't see the boundaries between communities. We see the communities. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's fantastic. So, so you... you uh, you really fell into this space of creating these 3D modules uh, and, and using that new technology to advance the field of architecture. Mm. Um, how did that get you to your, your company now? Like, you know, yeah. what, what, where was that aha moment? Was it, was it back on the trails of the Appalachian? <laughs> you know, or you know, somewhere in between? Like, how, how, did, you get, how did you get here? I, I, I think we're still like a step behind that. Yeah, well, there, there's a book that really details it that I admit is only about one-third done. Um, but, <laughs> you know, why, why does anyone sit down to write a book? Because they're trying to find the words to describe something really important, right? Mm -hmm. And what I found myself doing with architects time and time again, and then in the studios that I teach at New York Tech, was saying, what are the kind of buildings that are now accessible to us? Mm -hmm. now that we can simulate building growth that, mm -hmm. that we didn't have access to. Well, there's some answers out there um, that I think we've all seen with the, the buildings with potato chip roofs and the swoopy this and the glossy that. And that, that's a real impressive and important part of the architectural discourse. But mm -hmm. it's really the concentration of capital for showing off. Okay. And that's exciting to me, I, I must admit. But the other kind of buildings that are accessible to us because we have this technology, are you know, less expensive, but they're the same building because we can plan yeah. it. And they're higher quality because now we can simulate the issues that this building will face in 10, 20, 30. Not intuit them because you know, there's some gray-haired architect in the back looking over plans, it has interpreting the experience them. And, and kind of like this, this background knowledge of like, hey, I've ran into problems X, Y, and Z and these types of issues, and right. so we need to plan for that. Now it's like, actually, let's simulate this. Exactly. Let's see it in real time. And, and you probably know as, as well as anyone that um, experience is invaluable, but mm -hmm. it's also sometimes our biggest impediment. Um, yeah. In that, you know, the assumptions we bring to a Absolutely. problem sometimes blind us to so solutions that aren't available. Absolutely. So yeah. having that sort of external dialogue with the simulation, mm -hmm. I expect this to be 127 play. Oh, it's 133, mm -hmm. right? Like, wh where where were my assumptions wrong, and is the tool wrong? 
Mm. And then once we've got those two things figured out, what new knowledge do I have to bring, you know, a new kind of building to the table? Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's you know this uh, makes me think about, um, you know, just the the kind of revolution, you know, that that we're really taking a look at here. You know, like when we're talking about changing from paper to virtual and then transitioning from that virtual space back into the physical, mm. you know, um, that uh, that's a really powerful concept to, to be able to, it's kind of a learning tool, mm. right? It's, it's an opportunity to just have continuous learning and more of a, 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 an entrepreneurial mindset about how you're building things, mm -hmm. uh, which I really love. And um, it makes me think about this uh, gentleman, Jeremy Rifkin, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, talks about the third industrial revolution and how those things change over. He, he you know, it's, and it, I think he's, he, he explores the idea of zero marginal cost societies where, um, you know, he, he identifies that as we've transitioned more into di the digital space, uh, a lot of industries have had to re reinvent themselves because they're seeing their mar marginal costs come almost to zero, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we look at Napster and the music industry and like, you know, we're not selling CDs anymore. You can, you can replicate that song a million times over for almost no money, right? right? Um, you're kind of talking about a similar principle with your idea in the architecture space, where you can you can literally replicate <laughs> circumstances for different modular parts of a home for almost zero marginal cost. Is is that fair to say? <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of overlap here yeah. in in Rifkin's thinking. There's some places where we'd like to to think differently but sure. <coughs> excuse me there's places we'd like we'd like to benefit from this uh, what you're talking about with marginal costs I think um, rear them the the it becomes a carrying cost in the design industry because risk is what we're always abetting mm -hmm. um, the way that the design industry has sort of codified itself in the last hundred years is to identify folks that have passed some sort of professional licensure uh -huh. And they're the ones that are author authorized to kind of, with their license, weigh all these... All the risk. Yeah, all these influences, and then say, this is the amount of risk we should take. You know, for simple things like fire code, like, mm -hmm. hey, we need another exit here. And um, what clients actually are interested in, which is like, you know, how can I make sure I don't go over budget? What, what decisions can I make to make sure that in 15 years my energy bill isn't crazy? Yeah. Right? So, so the design trades are trying to... Um, reduce their marginal cost mainly by hedging risk. And when you literally have a crystal ball sitting on your desk, yeah. right? you have this simulation of how this is all going to fold out. Right. You're able to take more confident and specific risks because you can see how it's going to play out in many ways. And you have almost, in, in, in many ways, a, a unfair advantage in the, in the playing field because yeah. you know, the contractor is trying to realize something that's never been seen before, that building. Yeah. But you've seen it before. <laughs> yeah. It's been sitting in your computer for six months. For six months. Well, and it totally, it fundamentally changes the conversations that we have about development and about building things, mm. I feel, right? It, it, you know, um, because we're able to reduce those risks there you go. and lower the marginal costs, yeah. um, we can have more informed conversations before buildings start going up that can assuage or 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 address the needs that within a community more effectively right I, I think it's a, a tool that allows us to bring in that community insight in a much more direct way and say well this is what the community is saying they need this is what people are saying they're concerned about let's put it in the model Mm -hmm. and see if it works. This is great. I, I think that what you're saying happens two different ways. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's 1982 and we're thinking about putting 16 uses a, units of housing somewhere, well, the, the organization that's putting up that money, a million dollars, to put, build this housing, is pretty much going to want to hedge as much risk as possible mm -hmm. by reducing the number of stakeholders Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I have a design team and I have the government overview and that's all I want. But yeah, because right? anything more is just time and money. Right. Right. Yeah. And who knows if we have hearings on this, yeah. what the community will ask for, critique or demand. Right. Now, when you have a crystal ball sitting here, 
Yeah. And you say, okay, well, why not widen out the stakeholders, the circle of stakeholders? Yeah. We can still manage with what we've got and the limited resources we can bring to this um, to entertain more stakeholder viewpoints yeah. and possibly make new f sources of revenue, new sources of income, you know, yeah. or um, simply be a better community partner um, yeah. for, you know, the next development that's coming down the line. Yeah. So by reducing the risk of, t of increasing the um, tributary of stakeholders, um, what we're really doing is empowering more voices and at the same time assuaging fears. Of, yeah. all the, of all the folks involved. Well, and I think it also creates a, a level of transparency that uh, is often considered too risky. Uh, when, 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 uh, when you've invested millions of dollars into a development project and, and you're like, wow, the money's already spent, we, we, we've, we're shovel ready, we're starting to break ground. Right. The last thing you want is to, is, is, is to have uh, issues come up that, that extend that timeline. And, but at the same time, from a community perspective, like that's often when communities get involved, right? Exactly right. That's yeah. often when communities are all of a sudden aware of the fact that like a new building is coming up, right? Uh, so, but like with, with this kind of crystal ball, which is a GIS or, or three-dimensional <laughs> model of a, of a building site, right. you can have those conversations well in advance with the community, mm -hmm. and that incorporates uh, the needs of the community, that provides space for the community to say, yeah, this is how we can benefit from these types of development projects. And that creates, to me, community wealth, right? That allows not the stakeholders not just to participate, but to be engaged in a process that allows them to, uh, to uh, build wealth in their community and, and uh, and be more active participants in the development process without like you know limiting or 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 obstructing that those plans moving forward yeah this is exciting I, i'd like to expand exactly what you said sure. with another dimension a mentor once handed me a coin okay right yeah and this mentor said um on one side of the coin is trust yeah on the other side of the coin is control they're really the same thing and any situation you're in, if you don't trust the situation, you're going to strive for more control over the situation. Yeah. And if you do trust the situation, that's the circumstances you're going to be able to release control. Mm -hmm. Since we're both parents, I think we understand the whole <laughs> spectrum yeah, of parenthood intuitively. is this. Yeah. Now, the reason I bring it up <clears throat> is because the actual wealth within a community, I believe, is it's trust. trust. Yeah. Right. And when you establish as a developer a track record of being someone who responds on the third, fourth, and fifth project to community needs, you're not making just a bank of housing or a real estate portfolio. You're making a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship founded on trust. Yeah. Uh, the grist of that relationship is communication, open yeah. communication. Yeah, and the wealth that we all share is the ability to not have to control everything and to right. be able to focus on what we want because we trust yeah. what else is going on in the community. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Trust, you know, uh, for me, I, that translates to social capital. Exactly. Right? That yep. translates to, you know, can we work together for mutual benefit, nice, right? Uh, like taking that right down to that question. If you can answer yes to that question, then there's a mod there's a, enough trust to start developing some kind of culture around that, right? And and through that process, then when we get into things like uh, you know how do we utilize our natural capital or our natural resources, uh, you know, in industrial ways, you know, which what you're talking about today is really industrial capital, like. You know, how, how can we use that trust and the social and cultural capital we've developed to inform the ways that we build out our, our industrial capital, mm -hmm. the ways that we use the resources we can generate to um, really facilitate a process for community wealth, a process where, you know, um, businesses, nonprofits, governments, community citizens can all be a part of that conversation in dialogue um, to, to build something that they all care about. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that that really kind of um, brings down to the ground exactly the, the kinds of ideas that, that will help 
many communities that are struggling move forward. Uh, and that's why I'm so excited about what you're doing with Build With Logic, you know. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're, we're beyond excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can't so, sleep at night. So tell me, like, you know, this is, I think we've landed. This is how you got here, right? right? You know, right, right. like, uh, what are you doing in the community right now? Like, how, how is, what does this look like right now in, in the moment for you? So uh, you had mentioned both uh, social capital and cultural capital. Mm -hmm. um, so right now um, we're in the founding stage um, and we're finding capital now, financial capital, uh, mm -hmm. in order to complete the build out of this factory in southern Vermont and simultaneously identify um, the multifamily housing um, pro projects that we will begin to contribute to. Mm -hmm. um, and what's kind of beautiful about what you said is that it's really a cycle, yeah. right? Um, uh, we're finalizing our um, outreach to investors. We'll be establishing um, the last de details of the plant, um, ideally in this calendar year, and then beginning the relationships we just talked about just yeah. you know uh, four minutes ago in order to build more social capital, in order to build more cultural capital um, to uh, expand the plant. Yeah, you know our 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 idea of success is not simply how many kitchens, bathrooms, and utility rooms that we're uh, serving, but we have a metric in our own documents for how many interns we've taken from um, the local area trade schools, and for us that would be River Valley Tech, mm -hmm. right, and the um, mm -hmm. the trade school attached to the Brattleboro High School. Um, so if we're not training up the next generation, then what are we doing here, right? Exactly. This has got to be an educational facility yeah. as quickly as it is going to be a industrial yeah. one. Well, I, I really love that approach to business development in general, you know, building connections with institutions and, and, and uh, you know, organizations that are already doing this kind of work, that are already trying to facilitate workforce development, that are already interested in trying to solve the housing crisis or bring the cost of housing down so that it's more equitable for a diverse set of populations. Like finding ways to connect with those organizations and those institutions uh, as as a business owner is is important, um, and I think that that creates a level of sustainability uh, mm. that that transcends like some kind of like your standard business cycle. That's where we see that cyclical process of of you know uh, some people would call this a uh, virtuous cycle. Of development, uh, other you know, I, I look at it more like a, 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 a cyclical wealth, yeah. You know, because you're building a business that is generating new capital, right? Uh, in a way that um, other organizations can participate in, and it's that collective, collect that collective participation that creates impact and shared value that wasn't there before. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I we we agree and. In interpret that three different ways in our own formation. Yeah. The first is that, um, you know, we're not interested in being a dyed-in-the-wool kind of the, the manufacturing that left America's shores in the 70s mm. and 80s. And so in our founding documents, we're looking at an ESOP model, mm. right, where um, mm. employee ownership. What's ESOP? Yeah, can, can you, <laughs> uh, 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 what's the acronym? Well, it's, uh, just to make it easier than the acronym, sure. it's a way that the employees can both, uh, of, of any business, right, can essentially be the directors of that business. I see. And the okay. owners and profit share of that So business. they have ownership over the, the profits e involved. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And so this ESOP model, I think, is highly appropriate because that is what helps businesses survive the business cycle. Yeah. Right? When everybody's in for the sacrifices that have to be made and people just don't seemingly get randomly laid off. Well, and it's, right? it's rooted in the community. You know? Exactly. Uh, when, when you have that kind of model in place, you're not going to pick up and move to China, right? Right, right, you know, right. You're, you're there for the long haul, and it's, it becomes a community institution. It, it becomes something that the community can utilize to reinvent themselves if necessary or to, or to have that sustainable growth uh, over the long term. And I love that. Um, and it really speaks to the fact that this is not just about raising money and, and putting a plant on the, on the map, right? Uh, it's it's really about um, creating a space where uh, everyone is is receiving value from That's the operation. Critical. Right, right. So so it's not about, if you will, financial capital. 
mm -hmm. right? and that being the driver, but about being and building social capital and about being and building cultural capital in that this is a learning institution, this is a research institute at some level, like mm -hmm. how could we improve ourselves, right? And then how can the relationships we build with the trade schools, with the um, tradesmen in the community, mm -hmm. and with the um, needs that our communities have for housing be synthesized into one focal point of mutual benefit? Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. Um, and it, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we've talked a little bit about John Abrams mm. and, and how that's kind of tied into this, this concept that, that you're reflecting on here. Um, you mentioned uh, to me in, in earlier conversations, uh, John Abrams' quote, what kind of cathedral are we building? <laughs> right? Um, right. What does right. that mean to you? So, so uh, that is, that is a, a wonderful, the companies we keep is the book that's really helped us form mm -hmm. our idea of this ESOP model. And then I think it's chapter eight is, is, the, is the title. Yeah. Uh, and, and the challenge, you know, is, you know, you know, how can this be a, um, not just a business, but an, a, um, a long serving focal point in the community for how social capital, how all kinds of capital are focused and then mutually shared. Yeah. Um, the other really exciting part of the book for us is, um, you know, where he tackles the problem of craft. Mm. So, so, you know, the industrial, uh, from an architectural perspective, the industrial revolution explodes and there are these writers in the 1880s, like uh, John Ruskin, mm -hmm. who's sitting saying, you know, what, what does this, you know, tin that we just keep, you know, stamping and then putting up on our ceilings and roofs that has no soul, how is this a challenge to architecture? Mm -hmm. And the truth is, I don't think it was, it was a challenge to craft. Hmm. Meaning simply, if we endeavor in manufacturing pursuits where the same sad widgets are made over and over again, how are we growing? How are we not just manipulating each other and benefiting yeah. from the labor of others? Yeah. And the challenge in this book is really to um, imbue and infuse in an ESOP model the uh, decentralized ability for each stakeholder in the company to seek a higher level of craft and what they're doing, what they want to contribute to. Fascinating. So, uh, you know, from picking a project and saying, you know, do you want to work on this project and what do you want to improve about what we did about it last time? Mm -hmm. And then how can we empower you to make those improvements? Right. And then how can we help you highlight the improvements you made and profit from those improvements you made? Yeah. It's not just pulling the handle over and over and over again or installing the same widget over and over and over again. Right. It's about being better thinkers. Yeah. It's about being craftsmen, not just of the process, but of the product. Yeah, and it really brings that dignity and respect back to the trades that we were talking about earlier. It really kind of, it makes me think about uh, Mike Rowe, who did Dirty Jobs. There you go. Yeah, yeah. You know, he... Uh, he, he did this phenomenal TED talk where, you know, he, he talks about his aha moment. You know, he'd been do doing these dirty jobs for like, you know, 200 episodes. And he finally had this transition of thinking about, you know, how do we actually think about these dirty jobs? How do we, how do we look at the trades and, and the types of work that is essential for our communities in a way where it can be presented with dignity, where we can have you know, that quality of craftsmanship brought back to the workforce in a genuine way. Right. Right? You yeah. Know, I, 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 to me, that's really important because I, I think a lot of what uh, people are feeling is an alienation from their work, an alienation from the, the things they create, right? I, I totally agree. I think, I think the, um, the, the middle place where, where um, craftsmanship is lost is in a product. Yeah. So, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, if you and I need a pair of shoes, we would hire a tradesman or a craftsman yeah. named a cobbler, right? Yeah. That was his or her profession. And they would make a pair of shoes, and we would judge them and their abilities with the quality of our shoes. And wow. Today, that's not how we buy shoes. No. We buy products or, like, f footwear products. Um, and we identify our, our values not with that person or their abilities, mm -hmm. but with a brand and those brand values. Mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I buy Patagonia X, or I buy right. Right, Walmart Y, or whatever it is. That sort of um, uh, transition from trade to product mm 
uh -huh. meant that we started identifying some jobs micro called dirty jobs uh -huh. as just these things that created these products that were detached from our consumer experience right. and thus lost their dignity. Yeah. We just fail to appreciate all these huge septic systems and sewer systems that make yeah. our lives, you know, healthy and easy. Yeah, and infinitely more convenient, <laughs> right? Because we can't see them and we can't see the product of their of their of the um, labor. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm I'm very sensitive, I think, to that maintaining and highlighting that that continuity from the yeah. tradesmen through in in our case a product, a kitchen, a bathroom or utility closet all the way to the end user's consumer experience mm -hmm. because if that isn't telegraphed mm -hmm. then we lose our identity in the process and mm -hmm. in doing so we lose pieces or spokes of the wheel of our own community yeah yeah well said well said I couldn't agree more and uh, I think we've already answered this question in part but uh, I, I always like to land on this um, how are you building peace in your community right now yeah, I, I think we're tackling, you know, two dimensions of that, you know, head on, which is um, when housing is scarce and when we see in the headlines there's a housing crisis, then there will be strife around a scarce resource. Yeah. And so the sooner we tackle this housing crisis as a community, um, and, and that, that solution isn't coming from beyond Vermont's boundaries. Mm -hmm. There's no one that's going to come over here and build housing for us. No right because um, they have to build housing for their jobs and their communities um, the sooner we address the intractable seeming issues surrounding the housing crisis I think the more we can concentrate on the more you know uh, rewarding parts of our community experience yeah. so we're really trying to tackle the housing crisis the other thing is you know we've we've outsourced so much of manufacturing overseas yeah and we're really excited about bringing manufacturing back to our communities, giving it the dignity it requires, and helping the entire community benefit from that. Yeah, I think those two two legs are critically important for our efforts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just to kind of maybe push that uh, one step further here, um, you know, I speaking of the housing crisis mm -hmm. in the United States and and the the acute housing crisis that we're dealing with here in Vermont, there is a lot of conversation going on right now about housing in Vermont. And I think there's a lot of, you know, very strongly held differing opinions regarding housing in Vermont and how development occurs. You know, uh, to mention some of the more poignant topics that I've been listening to in different spaces is, you know, the, the subject of Act 250 and S100. Right, you know, so uh, Act 250, I, I think most viewers of this channel are, are very familiar with that act, and S100 is a is a, uh, a an approach to overhauling some of that Act 250 to allow for new housing development. Um, that can be a really divisive space. Um, how, how are you serving as a peace builder in that kind of conversation with this type of approach? To housing. Well, in our municipal government in, in Brattleboro, I'm trying to participate, you know, in ways that that are responsible and constructive. Uh, I also support our um, senators, uh, um, Nader Hashim uh, and Wendy Harrison, as they uh, try and sculpt S100 to be um, the legislation that will help us concentrate. Um, housing into our community centers mm -hmm. where it will contribute um, to transportation networks where it will contribute to the food deserts right, right. ameliorate some of the food deserts we have here in Vermont um, and so you know I'm trying to offer any expertise and support I can from an architectural perspective to help us chase and attract multifamily housing that will solve the missing middle and the low-income housing needs in our community. Yeah. And I feel like um, uh, changes to Act 250 in those directions, like S100, are steps in the right direction for bringing, um, you know, towns like Brattleboro have like these old wood, wood like uh, carvings, like an image of what Brattleboro was 150 years ago. Yeah. And it's all multifamily housing. Yeah. Right, it's, it's 1845. Everyone's huddled around to stay warm and to be close to the general store. And you drive around um, a lot of Brattleboro today and it's not. Yeah. 
Uh, I think every community in Vermont has an experience like that. Interesting. Um, and so I'd love to see more multifamily housing in our communities yeah. to help folks just starting a family and just starting a career yeah. you know, have that step up. But if I may, I, I want to like kind of push that a little bit further based on our, our whole conversation today as we kind of wrap up. You know, I, from what I have learned to understand about the development process and the innovations you're bringing to architectural design and and the way that homes are built, um, it, it brings me back to that fundamental aspect of bringing the whole community into that development process, right? Great. Um, it really, uh, it, it help, I, I, I feel like that is a process of peace building. Oh, yeah. And I feel like, um, you know, that is where a lot of the conversations break down. Uh, there's this fundamental concern over control and trust yeah. when it comes to new developments and how it gets played out in our communities, right? But if we could create a culture of development uh, that involves the whole community, I think there's a lot more space for trust. There's a lot more opportunity for people to work together to, to meet all of our needs, because there are critical needs that I think that are present in Vermont as well as many other places in the United States right now, particularly in terms of housing, uh, that this type of business design, this type of architectural innovation uh, really helps to resolve. And that goes well beyond, you know, participating in, in local politics, which I very much advocate for, but I, <laughs> I, I think this is a, a practice of peace. I agree completely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, we're definitely striving to create a view of the continuum of how we train the next generation of tradesmen. Uh -huh. You know, concentrate, you know, not only their labor, but our intelligence into a place of production. Yeah. And then responsibly use that concentration to build less expensive, ideally multifamily housing, in the places where it's welcome in our communities. Mm -hmm. Every step of that involves community and involvement, you know, stakeholder voices, mm -hmm. and, you know, tacit approval. Yeah. Um, and it would be a pleasure, honor, and in many ways, you know, a sign of success. Mm -hmm. The more stakeholders we can, we can um, accommodate mm -hmm. and, and the more um, housing we can bring to our communities. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to have to yeah. be on the show today. What a pleasure. Um, uh, it's been my pleasure as well. Uh, I, I love what you're doing. I think that uh, as a peace builder, uh, you're right there on the front lines, and I, I applaud those efforts. Um, what we're here to do is, is to talk about the ways that, that we can build community wealth. It's brought to you by Community Wealth Development. Uh, Coming up in, the, in our next episode, we're, we're hoping to focus more on natural capital and, and looking at how energy is a part of our communities and the way that we can build into more renewable and efficient forms of energy development. Uh, and we hope to have Jason, as well as all of our previous guests, back on the show um, to have a, a collective conversation about how we can build community wealth development together in January. Okay. No, in June. In uh, June. In June. Not Excellent. January, but June. Mark yeah. your calendars. So cheers. Thanks, Great. Jason. Thanks, everybody. Bye.